Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church of Hopkins, Michigan. Those of you who are here on site, as well as for those of you who are off site online. Uh, good to have all of you in gathered in, in uh, connection with the, uh, the Lord and His Word. Today is the Festival of the Holy Spirit. It is called Pentecost Sunday. And today also is the uh, Sunday in which we are going to examine our catechumens. You had a little bit of a note in the bulletin regarding why we do this and for what purpose. And uh, so please read that and uh, we'll get this uh, examination on its way during the sermon. We're going to be using service of the word. You'll find it on page 38 and following. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And, and also with you. We have the privilege and the opportunity to be able to come into the presence of our Lord and worship Him, who created us and to love and serve Him as His dear children. But you and I recognize that we have a problem. We've disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, we need to confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Let's do that together. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. The good news is this, that God our Heavenly Father has forgiven all of your sins by the perfect life and the innocent death of our Savior Jesus Christ. He has removed your sin and his guilt from you forever. The result is that you are a perfect blood-washed child of God. May God now give to each of us the strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let's bow our heads for the prayer of the day. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to each of us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, who lives with you and, and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue at the top of page 40 in our worship agenda on this festival of the Holy Spirit. When you think about it, how little the Holy Spirit gets emphasized in our Lutheran worship. Seems like we are always emphasizing Jesus, and I'm not saying that as, a, uh, as something that's bad. Um, but today is the festival of the Holy Spirit, and we focus on His work and His coming to us, especially with that sevenfold gift of grace. Something that we are doing this morning and we haven't done for a while, that is actually our first lesson from the Old Testament. We go back to the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. Here the Lord asks the prophet Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? Without God's Spirit, Though there may be physical life, there can be no spiritual life. Without God's Spirit, what is dead, with God's Spirit, what is dead is made alive. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you will all know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. 
I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. The bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord has spoken. And I have done it, declares the Lord. Thus far, our first lesson. Our worship continues this Pentecost day with the psalm of the day, Psalm 51b. You'll find that Psalm 51b on page 87, front portion of your hymnal. Let's speak the psalm in unison as has been our custom lately. <coughs> psalm 51b, page 87. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. You will not despise. Create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue with our second lesson. I emphasize second lesson because it seems that we just can't get away from the book of Acts. We've been using the book of Acts as our first lesson for the Sundays after Easter. And now the first Sunday... Uh, that we aren't using the book of Acts in our first lesson. It is our epistle lesson. Our second lesson is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Here the evangelist, Luke, recorded the spectacular outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. The apostle Peter's stirring sermon proclaimed that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Chapter 2 of Acts. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here ends our second lesson. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in them the fire of your love. Our third and last lesson is recorded in the book of John, John chapter 14, verses 25 through 27. Jesus told the disciples not to be afraid because he was not going to leave them as orphans. <coughs> Instead, when he would leave them, he would send them, he would provide them with the comforter, the Holy Spirit. <coughs> verses 25, 26, and 27 of Jesus' words in the upper room on morning for a evening. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Here ends our gospel lesson. Our worship continues with the hymn of the day, hymn number 176, Come Holy Ghost, God and Lord.
Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. This morning we have the privilege to have our catechumen examination. The first question you may ask is, why do we learn the word of the Lord in the first place? Why do we instruct our children in the word of our Lord? After all, what we do doesn't save us. The first reason why we do that is because our Savior told us not just to know His word, but He wants us to understand that word as well. So that you and I can take that word, not just believe it, but so that we can apply it to our lives and put it into practice. And most of all, so that we can share it with others. Because first of all, you don't share with others what you don't understand, what you believe, what you don't believe. But if you do believe it and understand it, odds are you'll share that with others as well. Sometimes without even realizing it. Jesus told us, Matthew 13, he said, But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Matthew 13, 23, that was the sower and the seed. The other Gospels have that as well. It's a very important verse. Blessed is he who hears the word and understands it. Not just with the head knowledge, but heart knowledge as well. Jesus also replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Probably one of our familiar passages, Luke 11, 28. And James told us, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. James 1, verse 22. A second reason why you and I learn the word of God, even though it demands work and sacrifice and time and patience and effort, is because when you and I listen to His Word, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to believe it, to obey it, to share it with others. That's when you and I are being worthwhile students of our Savior. We call them disciples. We're giving Him the glory by doing that. And that's what Jesus deserves for each of us, doesn't He? As our loving response for what He has done for us in life, suffering the death of the cross and His glorious resurrection. He told us, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. One of the comments I made to the gentlemen here before you that are going to be examined this morning is that it is one thing to hear and study the Word of God and write it down on a test. It's another thing to hear the Word of God and then process it and then be able to, to talk about it. And I think that's the reason why so many times we don't share it with others, our friends, our family, is because we just haven't gotten to the point where we're used to doing that. And it takes, it takes some effort. It takes some practice. And, you know, obviously... Uh, you know, quickie examination process yesterday, you know, you're still going to have some problems. Again, that's the reason why you need to be doing it all the time. Practice sharing the word to your, your dog and cat. And it takes time, it takes practice to take it to that next level. You also have been given a chart, a commandment chart. Um, if you would desire, and I would encourage you because what you take home with you, you can put it in practice. When you don't take home, um, it goes in and out. <laughs> it does you nothing. It does nobody else any good. Because what you don't take home with you, you can't share with your friends and family. And you don't. So, again, one thing that you can take home is a summary of the Ten Commandments this morning. That's the section we're going to be looking at. The last couple of times I've done the the Catechism Examinations, I concentrated on the Gospel of the Articles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Articles. Today I'm focusing on the Law. And that really isn't a bad thing because you and I recognize the commandments predominantly as third use of the Law. And that's a different kind of Law. So, 
So I would ask that you would fill out that chart. Um, it's not a quiz. Um, if you can't fill it out right now, well, then you're going to learn something this morning. And if you don't learn something, then um, um, we got big classes that uh, you can take to uh, review and refresh. All right, guys, we're ready to go. Go ahead, stand up. If you can't hear them, raise your hand. Let me know. Because if you can't hear them, people online can't hear. So, and I think that's, that's a crime. That's, that's a travesty. That's the reason why I have a, a mic them up this morning. So, uh, they didn't have a mic yesterday, so they're not used to the mic. But uh, they will get used to it in the next few minutes. Again, in times past, I've gone through many sections of the catechism. We're only doing one section today. So hopefully it won't take, um, we won't be here until afternoon. All right, eight, you're up first. Remember, focus into that mic, okay? Speak loudly. We're going to be talking about the law with the commandments. That's the message of, of God's word. The other message is the gospel. We're going to focus on the law. The law has two sources. What are the two sources of the law? The two sources of the law are written in our hearts at birth and in the Bible on Mount Sinai. Okay, two, two ways that you and I get God's law. What's the basic message? What is the Lord trying to get across to us with his law? The Lord is trying to get across to us what to do and not to do. And when you and I realize that what the Lord tells us to do and not to do, we haven't done it. What's the resulting judgment that we find out from God's holy law? The resulting judgment is God's anger and wrath and eternal death and hellfire. Yeah, not exactly news that you and I like to hear. That's the reason why it's called the bad news, the sad news, the kind of news you and I don't like to hear kind of news. And that's what many people just close their ears, selected listeners just close their ears. I'd rather hear good news. I'd rather hear something that makes me feel happy and, and fuzzy and warm all over. And yet, the law has its purposes, as we will find out in a little while. All right. Kobe, the Lord gave his law in two different ways, as he sort of briefly alluded to. What are those two ways? The Lord gave us the law in two places. At birth, it was in our hearts, but that got clouded by sin. So he also gave us them on Mount Sinai to Moses. Excellent. Again, every single one of us has a rendition of God's law. But the problem is, it's a crappy one. It's a confusing one. You don't know what God wants. You may think, we think up here, well, I, I know what he wants, and I feel what he wants, but you don't know. You're confused. You're clouded by sin. That's the reason why you have to go to the good book. Thus says the Lord. That's where the exact, that's where the explicit edition of God's law is. Until you do that, you're going to be floating around like everybody else, following the natural knowledge of God's law, thinking that they know the truth, and really, they have no concept of what the real truth is. They're just fooling themselves. That's the reason why the Lord gave us his law a second time, because that is the explicit edition. That is, when you want to find out what the Lord tells you, you go to the book. Don't trust this. Don't trust that. Trust only what the Lord says. We have a couple of summaries of God's law. What's a simple summary of what the Lord tells us in the written law? The simple summary of God's law is the time what about the simplest summary? If I, if, I, if I don't remember the Ten Commandments, and which you should be able to take home with you today with that commandment chart, put it on the refrigerator, and go through that every single day. Because, again, like I said before, you don't know those commandments. If you can't tell me what the Seventh Commandment is and what it tells you to do and not to do. You're not doing it. Okay? If you don't know what the Fourth Commandment is, you're not doing it. That's the reason why you need to keep these laws. The Twenty Commandments. What the Lord tells us to do and what not to do. What's, this, what's the simplest summary? The simplest summary is love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to uh, get into this too much, but the Lord gave us several different kinds of laws at Mount Sinai when he wrote them down. Some of those laws apply to us, some of them don't. 
Remember, remember what those three laws are? It's civil, moral, and ceremonial laws. Okay, civil law. <coughs> Governing the people of Israel as citizens. Ceremonial. The ceremonial law regulated the religion of the Israelites. And the moral. The moral is for everyone, and it governs them internally in their hearts. Good job. Aiden? Three reasons why we will obey God's holy law. Nobody ever forgets this. The reasons why we need to obey God's law is because we have to, we need to, and we want to. Which one is really the most important? Because we want to. Yeah, we don't want you here because you have to. We don't want you here because you need to be here. We want you here because the gospel has motivated you to be happily here because you want to be here. The Lord demands that we keep his law how? Lord demands that we keep his law 100%. Okay. Or perfectly. And of course, you and I haven't done that. We've actually failed to keep the Lord's law in two different ways. We call, we call them sins. Sins of? Commission and omission. What's the sin of commission? The sin of commission is when we do something that the Lord forbids us to do. And the sin of omission is when we don't do something that the Lord wants us to do. When we have failed. And, and if you notice, that's what we, in our... Uh, confession of sins, we not only confess that we've done things that are against God's will and word, sins of commission, but we've also failed to do things that he expects us to do. And frankly, if you don't know all of God's word, there are some things that you don't know he wants you to do, so you're not doing it. So we fail to do uh, God's word as sins of omission. Who only has kept God's law perfectly? The only person to ever keep God's law perfectly is Jesus, the Son of God. And we'll talk about that later on here. Colby, um, the next question that I will have on the sheet is the three reasons or purposes why the Lord gave us his holy law. But we're going to come back to that at the end, like I told you. All right? So we're, gonna, we're going to uh, not talk about that for right now. We're, let's get into the commandments instead. Um, first commandment. What is the Lord's first command? You shall have no other God. What does the Lord want to emphasize with the first commandment? That he does not want his glory to be shared. How can we give to God the glory that he demands exclusively? By fearing him above all things, by loving him above all things, and by trusting in him above all things. I think we all know what it means to love him above all things. I think Abraham uh, made that example very, very clear when he was willing to give up his own one and only son, Isaac, because the Lord told him to, simply. And I think we know what it means to trust in the Lord. David trusted in the Lord, even beyond his own weaknesses and abilities, when he fought the giant lion. Uh, oh, that the Lord would give us that kind of trust. But most people fail to remember what it means to fear the Lord. This is something I focus on in adult Bible class, day in and day out. In fact, if we don't have a a Bible class that we don't mention it, I'm, I'm um, you know, I'm, I thought you would, would be surprised. So what does it mean to fear the Lord, when, especially when we're talking about the kind of fear when it comes to the first commandment? To fear the Lord above all things means to put his word first. So even though somebody tells you to do this, or asks you to do that, maybe even mom and dad, and the Lord says this, to fear God means I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to listen to what the Lord says. So there are times when you and I have to obey God rather than our parents. There are times when we have to obey God rather than our government. There's times when we have to obey our parents rather than somebody telling us what to think, say, or do that is wrong. We listen to the Lord. And probably a good example of that is King Nebuchadnezzar told Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to bow down to that golden statue. And they said, no, the Lord told us we can't do that. So we're not going to listen to you, our king. Instead, we're going to fear the Lord. We're going to listen to him. We're going to follow his word. We can't follow your word. That's what it means to fear the Lord, to take his word ahead of all others. Hey, when we don't fear, when we don't love, when we don't trust in the Lord above all things, what is that kind of sin called? And it's the sin against the first commandment. When we have other gods, it's called the sin of idolatry. Good. All right. What is what is idolatry? What's a good definition? 
when you fear, love, or trust in someone or something ahead of or in place of the Lord. Good. What, kind, what kinds of idolatry are there? There's two kinds of idolatry. The first one is open idolatry. When you when you know visibly that someone puts someone or something ahead of or in place of the Lord. And, then, and there's secret idolatry. When someone puts someone or something ahead of or in place of the Lord in their hearts. Right. A good example is Israel worship the golden calf or something bowing down to Buddha. And another thing is that um, coming to church, for example, for ulterior motives such as to please your parents or, or the, to make things look good or um, for any other reason other than for our Savior Jesus first. How does this commandment serve us? We're going to be focusing on that later as, as a mere curve and guide. Um, and we're also going to talk about the, uh, the way Jesus saved us from our sins against this first and foremost commandment. Instead, we're going to talk about the, uh, the main thing that you can write down in your commandment chart. Uh, Aiden, what are, the, are the, the specific particulars of, of the key word for this commandment and what to take home, what not to do, and what to do? What would you suggest that they put down in the box? The key word for the first commandment is uh, God's glory. Or, yeah, God's glory. What to do is to put him number one, and what not to do is idols. What does the Lord promise to those who are idolaters? I made, I made this a very, very known, not just in catechism, but on, in adult Bible class, is that there will be no idolaters in heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Kobe, commandment number 2. What's the second commandment? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does the Lord want to emphasize with the second commandment? His name. What in the world is God's name? God's name is every expression used to reference the glory in the Bible. It is also what he has revealed to us in the Bible about him. And his title is what we call him and his word. So God's name is? God's word. And his and word is God's name. Why did he reveal his name to us in the first place? Bless us and to also save us. What does the Lord forbid us to do with his name, generally speaking? To use it wrongly. Okay. What are some specific ways that we can actually use it or misuse it? You can misuse the Lord's name by cursing, swearing, lying, deceiving, or using witchcraft. Right. So using his name to curse or to swear. I find that many people just don't have the foggiest idea what the difference of those are. I have sometimes people say, oh, pastor, he swore when really he cursed. And, oh, he cursed when really they swore. So what does it mean to curse? To curse means to wish evil upon something or someone. All right. And to swear? We can swear in a court of law. To use the Lord's name to bring people assurance that you are telling the truth. Yeah, do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I'll be gone? We're, we're convincing that courtroom that what we are about to testify is going to be the truth. And we're using God's name to convince them of that. Uh, same way that you can use somebody's God's name saying, I caught a fish this big, honest to God. And so by adding that honest to God, you've really swore. And it really is a, um, a very popular way to swear. Um, how, is it, how does the Lord want us to use his name? He wants us to use it in the right ways. Okay, Hayden, what are some specific ways that we can use the Lord's name in the right way, correct way? Some specific ways we can use God's name is to call upon in every pray, praise, trouble, or to give thanks. All right. Again, how does the second commandment serve us today as Christians, and how does Jesus save us from our sins against this commandment? We will let that go to the end. Again, give you give the opportunity to let us know what they can write down in their box for the second commandment. The key word is God's name. What not to do is to misuse it, and what to do is to use it rightly. Sound like they know what they're talking about. Good job, guys. Third commandment. What's the third commandment, Aiden? We're 
remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And so what does this commandment emphasize? Uh, a day of rest. Okay. A day of rest. Compliments of? What do we, what do we come together to hear? God's word. Right. It's a commandment, commandment that emphasizes our, our attention to or, or a lack thereof to God's word. Uh, what is meant by the term Sabbath? And I think you really referred to that already. Sabbath refers to rest. Rest. Right. What is our Lord's will in respect to the Old Testament letter of the law? In other words, we don't remember the Sabbath day anymore. But what was his will regarding the Old Testament? His will regarding the Old Testament was that the Old Testament people set aside the seventh day uh, more special than the rest. Right. Uh, this wasn't that they didn't worship on the other days of the week, but their seventh day was more special. They offered more sacrifices, better sacrifices. Uh, it, just, it was to be a day that outdid all the other six days. They went to church twice a day, seven days a week. But on Saturday the Sabbath, they did it really well. So he wanted that day to outdo all the other days in his house. When we talk about the New Testament spirit of the third commandment, we don't remember the Sabbath day at all. What is the what is the Lord wanting to get across to you and me with this commandment? Remember the Sabbath day. The Lord wants us to get across. The Lord wants to get across to us that He wants us to gladly hear His word. Spirit of this commandment tells us what we are to do. What what are we have to do with the word according to the third commandment? We are to gladly hear it and obey it, and what else do we need to do? What do we do in our heads and our hearts? Before you can share it or obey it, you got to study it. study it and believe it, right? And what does he want us to do when we have when we have heard it, we've learned it, we believed it, we've obeyed it. He wants us to share it with others. Right. We are guilty of despising God's word and his, his commandment when you and I do what? When we do not hear, when we do not go to church, we do not hear and heed it, and we do not study it, or we do not share it with others. When we're talking about the catechism, and I'm referring to uh, Hayden, will you hold up the two catechisms there? It's right underneath you. They're right on the thing. There's two catechisms. So one, we're still using the light blue one is the one we use, although the new one, the 2017, is the newer one. We, we don't use that in class, um, but those are two catechisms here. When I refer to the catechism, I'm talking about the, the light blue one there. And... Uh, the light blue one, the Kuski Catechism, as, as it's called, tells us that we are guilty of despising God's word when you and I refuse and neglect to hear God's word, study it, or learn it. Doesn't just mean on Sunday morning. And when you and I let anything or anyone crowd it out of our lives. In other words, we have other priorities. We got better places to go, people to see, and things to do rather than in our nose, and our ears, and our heads, and our hearts into studying of his word. And Let's, let's face it, that really is a big temptation for us all today. We've got places to go rather than to be in God's Word. And um, uh, that's, how, that's how Satan is seducing us to violate not only the third commandment, but actually uh, not showing our love to the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind. And he uh, the Lord also wants us to, to believe and to do it and not to fail to share it with others. Third commandment, what to do, not to do, commandment chart here again. What what can they write down in their commandment chart? The key word for the third commandment is God's uh, God's word. What not to do is to uh, despise, and what to do is to hear and heed. Yeah. When, when we fail to prioritize his word, we are showing our hatred to the Lord said we should fear and love God that we do not despise preaching and his word. Both of those. We're showing that we hate the Lord 
by the way we are are treating his word with contempt and ignorance and despising it. So again, like I say, uh, big temptation for us all, especially in these busy times when we got things in our schedule, people see things to do and places to go. Um, a lot of times what takes it in the shorts is is the Lord and his word. Hmm. What do I want to do that takes precedent and priority today? Going to church, going to Bible class, or going camping or fishing or, or going to work, even. Fourth Commandment, Kobe. What's the Fourth Commandment? Fourth Commandment is honor your father and mother, that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. What does the Lord want to emphasize with the Fourth Commandment? His representatives or authorities above us. Who are those representatives? We have representatives everywhere, in the work or school, in the church, in the state. Who's sitting out there in the pew? And in your home. Sometimes mom and dad are the ones you forget. So why do these people have authority over us anyway? Is it because they're, they're neat people or they are in office? Why, why do they have authority over us? Because the Lord has put them yeah, the Lord put them there. Enough said. No other reason to know that they are authorities over us. And what's the reason why the Lord has put them and placed them as authorities over us? To bless us. To bless us with what kind of blessings? With physical and spiritual blessings. All right, Hayden. How long do these authorities have authority over us? It depends on how long they have authority. It depends on if we're in their jurisdiction. Okay, in other words, for example, how long do you have to obey your mom and dad? Until you're out of the house. Until you're out of the house. You don't have to obey them when you're out of the house, right? Okay, mom and dad, just recognize that. What do you have to do to mom and dad for the rest of your life, though? Uh, respect them. Yes. In fact, what does the Lord demand and desire that we do to all of our authorities, even the ones you don't like? Uh, honor, serve, and obey them, and give them love and respect. Yes. Honor, serve, and obey them, and give them love and respect. In other words, don't talk about them behind their back because uh, they did something foolish. What does the Lord forbid us to do to his representatives? I think you guys got this down better than any class has ever had. I must have really, really did a good job emphasizing this. And so now don't want me down here. The Lord forbids us to dishonor, disgust, disobey, and disrespect them. All right. What do we call those? The four? The four disses. When we break the fourth commandment, what does the Lord give permission for his representatives to do to us, even to the point of being severe and harsh? To discipline or punish us. Right. Even to rebuke and scold us and instruct us. Right. Sometimes, you know, when I as a pastor in my office have to rebuke or scold you, people look at me and say, how can you be doing that? You're supposed to be a nice guy. Well, that's, that's my job. Part of my job is to rebuke you and scold you. Part of my job is also to, to, um, to be your discipliner as well. And again, if you're not going to be disciplining yourself, somebody has to look out for you and discipline, help you discipline yourself. There is one lone exception to this fourth commandment, and what is it? The one lone exception is if, it, if, if the authority tells you to sin against God's word. Right, and whether that authority is your mom or dad, the government, or even the church, um, or your boss, or your teacher at, at school. Um, if they tell you to do something against God's will and word in order to fear the Lord, remember First Commandment? you got to obey God's word and in a very, very respectful way, tell them the name of life. So what are the, uh, what are the suggestions for the boxes of the Fourth Commandment? Maybe? The key word for the Fourth Commandment is reps or representatives. What not to do is the four disses, and what to do is obey them. Okay, fifth commandment. Remember that one? The fifth commandment is you shall not murder. What does the Lord want to emphasize and protect with the fifth commandment? His gift of life. Okay, Kobe? Why is a person's life so important that it needs a commandment to be protected? A person's life is so important because it is their time of grace. What, what is the time of grace? Their time to come to faith in the Lord. 
Who alone has the right to end a person's time of grace? The Lord has the only right to end a person's life. He's given that permission or authority to somebody else. Who else has the Lord's permission to take a life? The government or the state. What does the Lord forbid with this fifth commandment? He forbids to harm another person or yourself. Or yourself, right. Suicide. Um, or actually to harm yourself by doing things that harm you, such as um, uh, under-eating, over-eating, over-drinking, stuff, stuff like that. What about what goes on inside the head? What does he say that is also murder? By hating someone. Right. Who so hated his brother to murder? And you know that no murder has eternal life by him. Murders will join the idolaters. There will be no murders in heaven. What does the Lord want us to do according to this commandment? He wants us to help and befriend our neighbor in every bond we need. Okay. Uh, I usually call this the five things. Be patient, kind, and forgiving. Help and befriend him in every bond we need. So that's the way I remember five things for the fifth commandment. This commandment does have some exceptions. What are they? Self-defense or a just war. Okay. Um, how does the commandment serve us as a mirror, as a guide, as a curb? We'll come back to that later. How did Jesus save us from our sins against this commandment? We'll come back to at the end. Hayden, you're good with the chart suggestions, so come on back. What should they put in their boxes for the fifth commandment? For the fifth commandment, the key word is life. What not to do is murder. And what to do is Samaritan. Be a good Samaritan. Okay, and, and the reason why... Be a good Samaritan because help and befriend your neighbor and everybody they need. And again, your neighbor isn't necessarily your friend, it can be your enemy. So Jesus said to uh, be a good Samaritan. So excellent uh, summary of the fifth commandment. What is the sixth commandment, Aiden? The sixth commandment is you shall not commit adultery. What is the Lord emphasizing and protecting with this commandment? His institution of marriage. What is marriage? Marriage is the lifelong union of one man and one woman. Can there be any other combinations? No. One man, one woman. Contrary to what our society is and how the media is doing that, trying to convince you that there are, but there are not. When did the Lord institute marriage? The Lord instituted marriage when he brought Eve to Adam. That was way back at the beginning, wasn't it? Right. How does he regulate marriage today? He regulates marriage... By his word. Right. His word tells us what the Lord wants us to do and not to do with as husbands and wives. And if you think you've got a better prescription for a Christian God choosing marriage, um, you, you won't. It's got to be in God's word. How does the Lord bless his institution of marriage that he regulates through his word? The Lord blesses marriage in three ways with companionship, with sexual pleasure, and with children. And then, probably a question that people don't realize, uh, what exactly is adultery? Adultery is when you cause a pain in the marriage, when you have a sexual relation with someone else, or when you have malicious, or when you have unscriptural divorce. Okay, so, so adultery isn't just, just going out of your spouse. What does it mean? What's the definition of adultery? You shall not commit adultery. Glass, dirt. I'm throwing some dirt in a glass of water. Uh, to make unclean. Right. And if a person is being a pain in the butt in marriage, that's adultery. Yes, that's considered, in God's eyes, adultery. Right? And destroying the loving companionship of marriage, adultery. But it's not grounds for a divorce. A person has sexual intercourse, marital unfaithfulness, Jesus called it, with another person other than their partner, that's, that's adultery. If they, if they divorce for an unscriptural reason, that's adultery. Of course, the Lord hates all divorces. He wants people to stay together and to work things out and to forgive and forget as they have been forgiven. 
There are two scriptural reasons, however, that the Lord has permitted. He doesn't like them, but he does permit a hard-heartedness that we have as human beings to, to go out and get a divorce. Uh, divorces are not God-pleasing. There is not one divorce that is. And of course, we're talking about uh, pursuing a divorce, not just the written certificate. All right? So what are the uh, two reasons why the Lord permitted a Israelite to get a divorce? The two reasons are a sexual relation with someone else or malicious desertion. How does an unmarried person sin against the Sixth Commandment? By having a sexual relation before marriage. How about what goes on in their head? Lustful thoughts. Right. What does the Lord desire that we do according to this commandment? The Lord wants us to keep clean and be pure. And for husbands and wives to keep the marriage back clean. Why does the Lord want to control our bodies and even more our private parts? Because our bodies are a temple of God. <clears throat> Key word, what not to do and what not to do, uh, to do for the sixth commandment. And again, what what body part are we talking about here specifically? The key word is sex organs or marriage. What not to do is to be unclean. And what to do is to keep clean. Okay, seventh commandment? You've been good with the commandment so far. You, what is the seventh commandment? The seventh commandment is you shall not steal. What is the Lord trying to protect with this commandment? Our things and belongings. Right, our stuff. Uh, what are they, really? What's our stuff? Things we have gotten from the Lord. Right. How do they come to us? We get them through purchases or gifts or even inheritance. How does the Lord want us to use our things and stuff? The Lord wants us to use our things for our family, our government, our state, or our church, various charities, and our own recreation. What is the teaching of Scripture that deals with the faithful use of our things and stuff to God's glory? Stewardship. Right. What does the Lord forbid us to do with this commandment? He forbids us to steal from others, to secretly steal from others, to rob others, to even have greedy thoughts, or to get stuff by dishonest dealing. Right. What is the attitude that will prevent us, maybe even go a long way, curb our desire to break this seventh commandment? What incentive does the Lord give us to be wise and faithful stewards? Liability and accountability. Right. He will hold us accountable for the way we use our things and stuff, because they're not our things and stuff, are they? Whose things and stuff are they? The words that he has given to us temporarily. Right. What instruction does the Lord offer us about our offering stewardship? In fact, uh, if you turn the page of the chart that you have, you'll see the the actually the support for our offering stewardship that the Lord gives in his scriptures. Now they're not going to give you every one of them, I just said suggest they give us one or two. First fruit giving, percentage giving, and give out of your poverty. Okay. When you understand that, then you'll understand what kind of God pleasing giving uh, that really is. Coming back to Hayden, he's our chart guy here. What do you suggest they put into the chart for the seventh commandment? The key word for the seventh commandment is our stuff. What not to do is steal, and what to do is steward. Okay, going on to the eighth commandment. What's the eighth commandment? The eighth commandment is you shall not get false testimony against you. What's the chief emphasis for the eighth commandment? 